This is Dan Schneider. The subject is men's rights. J. Steven Savota is my guest, and he is an expert on this subject. We will be speaking with him, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Steven Svoboda is my guest. The National Coalition for Men is an organization that he is a part of. Uh, let me ask you, Stephen, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself, how you formed uh, your group, and what its main purpose is. Well, NCFM was formed in 1976 by a group of two men and two women. It had another name, and then in 1977 it was called National Coalition of Free Men, and then we changed it to National Coalition for Men and kept the same acronym. Um, Around 2011, 2012, maybe, the, the Freeman term, people just didn't know what to make of it, so National Coalition for Men just seemed more descriptive, and um, I got involved, I'm the, I'm the longest currently serving board member, I got involved in 1996, 21 years ago, and uh, the Northern California chapter was founded in my house, and um, yeah, I've done a lot over the years, I was the uh, one of the main movers of the Northern California chapter, which is very active, and more recently I've been the public relations director and written about 200 book reviews about books relating to men and masculinity. Now, when you say that uh, about men and masculinity, are we talking of in more of a cultural context, a legal context, or both? Anything. I mean, I basically review anything that interests me, which I've always been fascinated by men and women, and so honestly, anything related to men and women that interests me, whether it's a book I think I'm going to like, a book I think I'm not going to like. Um, uh, since I don't get paid for my book reviews, they're published, they're all published, but I don't get paid. My one criterion is I can not review any book I don't want to review, yes. <laughs> which you probably could do even if you were getting paid. But anyway, that's my, um, that's my criterion. Well, let's talk about uh, men's rights, because I think when people nowadays hear the term, they look at sort of a monolithic group, and uh, uh, a lot of times it's uh, portrayed negatively, uh, that it's it's nothing but yes. a thing to bash women, it's nothing but a, a, a misogynistic outlook. Uh, but, you know, from what I can tell, I had another fellow uh, scheduled, uh, Paul Elam, who I guess would have represented a more activist or out out there, wing versus your group, NCFM. Uh, uh, is there is there really a, a plenum of men's rights group that are focusing on different areas? You're a lawyer, for example, uh, rather than an activist, I guess, or primarily a lawyer in your day job. Well, yeah, my day job, I'm a lawyer, but no, I'm, I'm definitely an activist in terms of NCFM. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because there's quite a lot of diversity. Paul Elam was one of the leading people in this movie, The Red Pill, that came out recently that I was also in briefly. And um, Paul, Paul and Voice for Men, basically, I think NCFM is mostly aligned with them, but not on everything. The main difference, I think, is tone. And different people take different tones and different organizations take different tones. And there's no right or wrong about it. It's not... You know, NCFM is better than Voice for Men, or Voice for Men is better than NCFM. It's just, I I see Voice for Men, and I don't, I don't think they disagree with me, as taking a little more uh, aggressive stance, you might say. Um, NCFM is more, we have resources, we try to um, create a win-win situation for men and women, and it's not that Voice for Men isn't doing that, but they're more focused on pointing out the inequities, which we agree with, but we just think there's different ways to approach this. And I, in particular, I mean, uh, I'm, I might be the most this way of anyone in NCFM. I very much, but others in NCFM agree with me, I, I very much feel that I'm, I don't really like the term men's rights, and I don't really look at it that way. I look at it as I'm trying to create fairness and equity, and if women were being discriminated against in some of the ways men are, I would be just as vehement about women's rights, um, and I am vehement about women's rights being enforced to the extent they aren't. Now, nowadays, I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress women have made, um, but I'm glad you said that because the term has always been a little bit of a stumbling block, and people hear it and they say men's rights, and, and granted, a lot of people hear the sort of standard line today, and I just read the that January issue of National Geographic about gender, and it's pretty infuriating because it goes on all these pages about all the things that men have suffered. It never mentions anything about men's um, uh, patient at all, except the last, very last page 
has a couple sentences that alludes to, well, maybe men have had some hard things to bear too. And uh, for example, circumcision, they talk about women's genital cutting, yeah. genital mutilation, all these pictures, how terrible it is. And then when men's circumcision gets raised, it's, oh, it's a cultural procedure and here's the benefits of it. And yeah, it hurts. And this is the boy getting ready for adulthood and transitioning. And it's just, it's so biased. I mean, if you're going to describe female genital cutting a certain way, we'll describe male genital cutting in a similar way. Just give us the same treatment. You give women, that's all that asking for at NCFM. We're just asking for a fair shake. And yeah. I, I think that's a very, and I'm sure, I'm sure the National Geographic editors thought they were being very fair and unbiased and open-minded and wow. I mean, in 2017, that's all I can say. Wow. Um, let me just talk about a, a thing uh, that I think that a lot of people think about men's rights. I think it's a, a bunch of whiny, beer-bellied, uh, neck-bearded, uh, is a term I've heard, uh, white guys just bitching about stuff. And uh, I had just asked about uh, the, the stereotype of uh, uh, men's rights guys being sort of these beer-bellied uh, white guys, neck-beards just uh, raging about this or that. Uh, is there a lot of inclusivity in men's rights? Do you have Hispanics uh, and, and men? And does men's rights also include uh, gays in any way as a political, cultural movement? Well, so here's the answer to that. Um, NCFM, our former vice president, who was one of the most effective people we ever had, he's a good friend of mine, Pradeep Ramanathan. He was born in India. He's, uh, I mean, you know, he's culturally American, but he was born in India. He's ethnically Indian. Um, like I said, two of the four people who started NCFM were, were female. We've had other um, people of color who were leaders in our group. I mean, I, I think the way we look at it in NCFM is anybody's welcome. Anybody's totally, you know, we're happy to have them. And I, I really don't think people look at color or, or anything like that. I think we're just interested in, again, making sure that things impact females and males equally. And I know for a fact that Harry Crouch, the president, and Mark Angelucci, the vice president, the current vice president, and, and I, all three of us, we would fight anything that, that created unfairness in the other direction just as vehemently as we fight anti-male discrimination. It's just that currently, as we see it, and I can definitely back that up, I think the anti-male discrimination is more of an issue that, than the anti-female discrimination, and that's the conclusion that the maker of the Red Pill movie came to as well when she made that, that movie that Paul Elam and I are both in. Um, it just came out on DVD, by the way, the red pill. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that uh, a, a lesson could be learned from, say, the gay rights movement. And I say this because uh, about a decade ago, once the first uh, lawsuits were going against the basic unfairnesses of uh, not allowing gays to marry, for example, and a, a host of other things, I thought it was going to take 25 years to wind its way through the court. But right. they were very skillful in pointing out the basic injustices. And it seems to me that when we're talking things about whether you talked about the, the general mutilation or about uh, uh, false rape accusations or about custody cases with, uh, with children, that uh, a, lot, a lot less heat is needed in, in the men's rights movement, at least public relations-wide, and a lot more just focusing on the basics. Uh, does NCFM focus more on the legal aspects, i.e. pointing out case A, B, or C that, that shows this? Because it would seem to me, if you follow the pattern of the gay rights movement, by showing a systemic bias in custody cases uh, and things like that, it would be much, much more profitable in getting it to be taken seriously by the mainstream media. Well, it's an interesting question, um, and you mentioning gay rights reminds me that um, there's been actually quite a lot of, you, your question about diversity, there's actually been quite a lot of um, gay and bisexual involvement, and you might think that wouldn't happen because the gender issues would seem to mostly affect straight men, but we have a current, NCFM has a current board member, national board member, who's bisexual, and um, there's one man I've worked with closely in um, San Francisco who worked a, wrote a very good book about dating, and turns out he's gay, but he sees the inequities and, and doesn't like them anyway. And there's a writer in Canada, um, I, I have to think for a second to remember his name, but he wrote a book, um, let's see, Catherine um, Young, I think was the co-author, Paul Nathanson, that's his name, Paul Nathanson. And he's gay, but he sees the inequities too, and he wants to fight them. So that's the sort of attitude that we've always had at NCFM. And so to get back to your question, um, 
gay rights has always been something I've really identified with, even though I'm completely straight. And maybe because I'm so secure in being straight, I've never had doubts that I think some men, not to overly psychoanalyze things, but some men are scared they're 10% gay or something, and so they stay away from gay issues, but I've never had that issue. And um, anyway, um, so it's very interesting, you're right, I, it's very interesting to watch their, their arc. I've watched it very closely, partly because the man who mentored me in arc, it turned for the rights of the child, my genital cutting related organization that I founded in, in uh, 97, 1997, it's our 20th anniversary right now. Um, Tim um, is gay and he was very involved in ACT UP, which I always admired as an organization and, and with other gay rights. In fact, he moved to Canada so he could be with his domestic partner because he couldn't do that in the U.S. and be domestic partners with them back in the day. So anyway, but, but here's the thing about gay rights. Um, Here's the basic problem, I think, that we face that nobody's been able to overcome. There's just a basic gut-level reaction that people have, and, and it's it's more an emotional thing, I think, than a logical thing. Like, uh, and I have it myself. Like, like I know, I know for a fact that men are victimized by domestic violence as much as women are, or slightly more. But it's still, on a gut level, is hard for me to believe, even though it's true. And I think the reason for that is. We grow up with these ideas, and we just see men and women as different, and we grow up with these ideas that men are powerful and they're strong, which is certainly true on a spectrum that the average man is stronger than the average woman, physically. Um, but we grow up with these ideas wired into us, and I think as a species, as people, it's hard for us to have sympathy for males. It's just hard. I mean, circumcision itself, when I first heard of that issue, I thought, oh, that's silly. Why are people wasting their time? on that and I, I definitely have a response to that now but that was my initial reaction and that's many people's initial reaction whereas people usually don't react that way about female genital cutting and part of the reason too is female genital cutting is in Africa and other countries and those, all, all this rush to condemn other cultures and not see our not see the mode in our own eyes so there's that also but um, I just think overcoming this this way of viewing gender is going to be hard for us and, and gay short circuited it by sort of align themselves with feminists in a way, and that was very astute of them. But masculists or, or people in, in, in favor of true gender equity are going to have a hard time aligning themselves with, with current feminists, at least the sort of National Organization for Women branch of feminism, because they've explicitly disclaimed any association there. They don't even like advocate for things that are actually, if you're a feminist, you should actually advocate logically for anything that's going to stop putting men and women in boxes because that's disadvantageous to both sexes in the end. So logically, the feminist movement shouldn't like only draft registration, for example. They should oppose that. It's a total stereotype. Women are too weak and vulnerable, and they can't go to war, and they would like die immediately, and so we have to protect them and keep them at home safe, whereas men are strong and, and brutal and, and can go off and like kill those bad people in the other countries. And It's a total stereotype. And that should, it should be enraging now. I mean, people now should be like yelling at each other, trying to figure out how can we get rid of male-only draft registration. But oddly enough, they seem to not be concerned about any discrimination that doesn't isn't to the disadvantage of women. And so they have thought this. And um, this is a very long answer, but hopefully you get my gist that we just have trouble as people seeing males as needing support, needing compassion. It's hard, it's hard for us to see. Yeah. Um, let me just, let's go back to, this, to, to the basics when we were talking about men being bigger and stronger. I mean, you would admit, though, and I think one of the things that uh, people, uh, the term MRA, or I don't know if it's pronounced UMRA, but MRAs uh, fit that stereotype I mentioned about the, the neck beards and whatnot. You would admit, though, that uh, history, uh, human history, has been male dominated in the sense that for every Catherine the Great, there are a hundred Alexander the Greats and, and Genghis Khans and Adolf Hitlers, that men are more prone to go to war because of testosterone, that men, you know, that, that there's that, that violence that men have. Uh, and I'm not saying that I think that also uh, is, is a, a large part of why men, generally speaking, have dominated the arts, creativity. The same thing that causes us to want to be more destructive also causes that uh, creative impulse. Um, and so uh, you would ad admit that, that, that there's even the term the great men of history was an old term, that 
uh, when women talk right. about things like that or earning right. less than men, uh-huh. these things are, are, are so. You don't dispute those basic facts, do you? Well, I, 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 here's my response to that. I, I think a lot of there's a lot of difference in how one things get phrased, and so I wouldn't phrase it that way. I would say historically, men and women had different roles, and also the roles fit with their proclivities, and I think it's a chicken and egg question whether the proclivities develop because of the roles or vice versa, but males were more wired to go out in the world, to go hunt, to go try to make the big kill, literally the big kill. Females became the gatherers. They, they went they went and gathered berries and talked to each other about which plants were poisonous and which weren't, developed their social skills while well, men were out being quiet and not developing the social skills, but developing the, the abilities to focus. And, um, you know, it does sound a little stereotypical, but there, there's truth to it. And so, yeah, I mean, most of the men who were driven enough to, like, d- deny a lot of other things in their lives because they were so driven to be the great artist or the great scientist or whatever, yeah, that's true. That's what they did. And also another fact that's somewhat important is that if you do a, a, a bell curve distribution of abilities... Males and females are pretty much exactly positioned in the same place in terms of the average. But if you take either a whole bunch of uh, things, you can take hours work per day, yeah. you can take uh, intelligence from an IQ test. May, there's more males at each extreme of the bell curve, at the, far, at the positive extreme and at the negative extreme. So I'm not saying men are smarter than women. I'm yeah. definitely not saying that. Men are not smarter than women. I'm not saying that. I'm also yeah. not saying women are smarter than men. I'm saying there's more distribution in how male traits are distributed, and it makes sense evolutionarily. Yeah. You want the males distributed more. The females are the ones that carry yeah. the, ma- the babies that the males conceive. You don't, you don't care if you waste four males, if you have four stupid males, and come up with one genius male. That's great. The genius male impregnates the woman. The, the, the genius baby comes out. It gets the genius father's genes, and you've had a great a net evolutionary gain. And the four idiot babies that died from the idiot males don't matter, assuming again the the male gene carried through, because obviously the female gene could have been the dominant one. So well, it, it's 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 awkward to even talk about this stuff mm-hmm. nowadays because it's so old fashioned and passe. It makes you sound like you're a cro magnon person and you're mm-hmm. from the 1940s and you want to stop all progress. And I'm definitely not that way. I'm definitely a person of 2017, but I don't believe in ignoring facts and i think that this is a fact that there's reasons that have nothing to do with discrimination or domination or whatever you use the word dominate twice why males had more scientific achievements and artistic achievements than females now i look at the world today and it's equalizing a lot there's even areas like college enrollment where females are actually yeah. have more than 50 percent representation so things are shifting and changing and there's certain areas today where Females are represented at least fifty percent. Well, and so I, it's, a, it's a complex picture. There's no simple answer. And for example, I've also read that a lot of the the gender gap in pay, for example, uh, whether it's a nickel or a dime or whatnot, is that for ninety nine percent of the people, it's pretty equitable. It's just that at the top one or two percent of any profession where males dominate, you will get CEOs, for example, that are ninety nine percent male that will make so much that will skew and and give that gender gap gap a greater you know, a greater uh, appearance than it actually is if you're looking at the news. There's some truth truth to that, but the main thing about the gender pay gap is there's no gender pay gap. There is no gender pay gap. Read Warren Farrell's book, Why Men Earn More. more. Uh, The book is written as as, uh, advice to women how to earn more, and the way to earn more is to do all the things that are the reasons why men earn more, which is work longer hours, travel to places you don't want to go, take jobs you don't want to take so you can make more money. They've done studies of males and females who have the same level of experience, haven't had kids yet, in the same field. And guess what? Females make slightly more. And that, you know, the the whole gender pay gap is such a myth. And you can't just stupidly add up all the numbers of what every man makes and add up all the numbers of what every woman makes because men and women don't have the same working patterns. Men work longer hours. Men have more full-time jobs per capita, per working, per working person than women do, etc. So, I, I don't mean to sound impatient in my answer. I just, I'm just so tired of this gender gap, pay yeah. gap thing because it's such a myth and it's just persistent. And this whole thing they do, where I forget what day of the year it is, but in April, supposedly sometime, 
the women have then gotten to the point where if they start working on January 1st, the men could start in April and they would earn the same amount of money. It's a myth, women. It's a myth, men. People are getting paid what their job values. And think about it. Would any company be able to survive paying a woman 80 cents on the dollar? Seriously? Every man would be fired and every woman would be hired the next day. Are you kidding me? It, it, it's absurd. It falls apart like a house of cards if you just think about it for five seconds. Well, let me, let me just ask about uh, feminism uh, in general. Uh, I would assume from what you're saying that you thought that at some point feminism was a good thing in terms of being for women's suffrage and things of that nature. Would you say then, though, that when we've gotten to the point, say, from the 70s or 80s onward uh, with feminism, uh, this sort of capital F feminism that uh, basically aligns itself in many ways with, say, the right wing. They're against uh, prostitution, a woman's right to sleep with whoever she wants and accept pay. They're against pornography uh, and things like that. And they look at those things, for example, as women being exploited by men rather than, uh, for example, I grew up in a very good fellows like environment and I knew a lot of people who made uh, pornography back in the 70s, even a famous filmmaker uh, that I knew. And it, it was it was it was nothing. It, there was no exploitation. It in fact it was far more equitable uh, than anything else. So, would you say do you is your position then that feminism was a good thing, but it's sort of gone, you know, cr jumped the proverbial shark? You know, it would be nice if it, it would be nice if there was quick answers to any of these things, but there just aren't. So let, let's let's talk about pornography a little bit. Pornography. So yeah, there's there's a fair amount of anti-pornography feminism. There's also some pro-pornography feminism. Female porn stars get paid way more than male porn stars do. Somehow people aren't complaining about that. Um, and yes, it's definitely true. There's a, definitely a good quantity of por pornographic um, films that are made with good working conditions and good pay for the actors and everything. And there's also bad stuff that goes on too. Hey, we don't live in a perfect world. I never said we did. Um, I, I'm quite sure that people are still being exploited in some pornographic films being made somewhere. I'm sure that men are being exploited. I'm sure that women are being exploited. So, and I'm quite willing to believe that women may be exploited more than men are exploited in that particular area. Um, and as far as feminism in general goes, yes, of course, I obviously... Well, maybe I should say obviously, but of course, women's suffrage movement was a great thing. But I would go a lot further than that. I mean... Feminism is still a good thing today. I mean, feminism interpreted for what it actually is supposed to mean. I mean, and a lot of people, a lot of women and men say they're feminists using that meaning, which basically is, ironically, what NCFM is about. A fair shake for, for males and females. We, look, I mean, the number of people that actually want in their hearts, that actually really want females to be discriminated against and held down and want males to have unfair advantages over them? Are you kidding me? I'm sure there's some. I'm sure there's some percentage. I'm sure it's not zero. And we saw some of those people come out of the woodwork since the recent presidential developments. I don't want to get into politics, but that just comes to mind. But um, I, I don't believe that. I don't, maybe I'm naive. I don't believe that high a percentage of people in this, in this country actually want gross injustice committed against their beloved sisters and mothers and daughters and partners. I don't believe it. So you've got you've got two strands of feminism. You've got genuine feminism, which in my mind I call genuine, which is fighting for genuine equality and trying to make the world a better place, really trying to do that. And there are definitely people who call themselves feminists, men and women, who, who are doing that. Um, I mean, there's Christine Howe Summers has written several good books, but there's many others. Um, and, and, and but then what's happened is the feminism and women's rights term has been carried forward into the current era. And honestly, what's happening is is things are getting more and more equitable in so many ways, not just relating to men and women, but in relating to race and a lot of other things. And yeah, we've got we've got plenty of problems. I'm not saying the world's angelic or anything. And again, maybe there's been some backsliding recently, but. The world's just a better place than it used to be, and that's the general arc of civilization. It's not its not a, like a line that goes straight up, but it, it goes up with bumps, up and down, but generally up, and I think that's the arc we've had. And um, so frankly, all these women's studies professors, and there's more and more all the time, they're running out of stuff to be professors about. <laughs> there's just not as, enough in, enough, as much inequity. So the feminist movement that I don't consider to be true feminist is charged with finding more things to complain about. And so now we've got, you know, 
um, uh, sexual harassment that isn't really sexual harassment and rape that isn't really rape. And I, I can say more about what I mean by that. But as a man, you know, it's not like men's lives are a cakewalk either. I mean, people aren't disposed to have as much sympathy toward you. And in a lot of jobs, there is, if you're, if you're a Caucasian male anyway, there is, um, it is harder to get a job because of the, of the programs that are in place. And it's not boo-hoo, poor me, but it's just a fact. It, it's tiring after a while to, to be in, in, a, in a place where you're not really seen sympathetically compared to other groups. And I, I just took my son to see um, The Mask We Live In, this movie by Jennifer Newsom Newsom about what, males are dealing with, the uh, young males are dealing with as they grow up, and, and I was, you know, it, it's not, it's not easy, I mean, my son's got a, he's 15, he's got a, um, a world to deal with that um, is different than the world that I grew up in, and in a lot of ways it's better, but in some ways as a male, it may be more challenging than it used to be, so that, you know, we got these educational issues that males have, males commit suicide a lot more often, and for some reason nobody's looking into that and spending millions of government dollars to get to the bottom of that, and that's shocking. The ratios are like five to one. Why isn't anybody up in arms about the male suicide rates versus female suicide rates? I mean, where, where, are, the, where are the male health health centers? Where, where, are the, where are the government-funded organizations devoted to men's health when men live less long than women do? And um, are much worse on pretty much every leading health indicator. It used to be we died of all 15 leading diseases more than women do. I think it's 14 out of 15 now, but... Um, you know, it's 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 it, it's just shocking that we're in 2017 and we're so advanced in some ways and so not advanced in other ways. Yeah, um, let me just ask about custody. I worked about 15 years ago uh, in Minnesota in a juvenile uh, court as a clerk, and I would often see a, a lot of custody cases uh, and stuff. Uh, I, and I'd have to throw away old cases and have to read through them to to retain certain things that would be carried on to to adulthood and whatnot. Um, what do you think accounts for uh, the clear bias that uh, men are presumed to be the lesser custodial parent uh, uh, in probably nine out of 10 cases? Well, it's the same thing as what we were just talking about. It's, it's, the, it's the difficulty in viewing males on an equal footing with females, where, you know, whether you're looking at, uh, you know, whether you're looking at, at uh, job work or uh, society's outlook on the health issues that males have versus females have, and, and it's funny you mention this issue because I just got divorced from my from the mother of my kids last month after after uh, fifteen years of being married, and um, it really make makes made me think because well, I mean we're still figuring out custody, and it appears we're going to be doing fifty fifty, and probably amicably without having to get the courts involved or anything. But um, when you get into these things, a male, is if you're if it's a straight marriage, which used to be all marriages were heterosexual, now you can't assume that, but you're talking about a marriage between a man and a woman, um, the man is at the mercy of the woman. I am at the mercy of my ex-wife. Because if she was mentally unstable, if she wanted to blame everything on me, if she if she made up some mental justification as to why it was okay for her to accuse me of something that would get me in hot water, she could do that, and I'm going to be assumed guilty until proven innocent. And in the meantime, the kids are going to be taken away from me. And that story plays out over and over and over, and NCFM's heard that story thousands and thousands of times. And some dads never get access to their kids. They see, I mean, Fred Hayward was in the, was in the Red Pill movie too. I mean, he finally saw his kid... After spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and losing touch for years, he finally got back together with his kid just recently. But uh, the kid's like 30 or something. I mean, you know, there, there's there's so many tragedies. And it's not just a tragedy for the father. It's primarily a tragedy for the child who loses out on the chance to have both their parents. And kids don't always realize they're losing out. They may feel like, oh, mom says he's a bad guy. It's a good thing I'm not involved with him. But really to have your entire heritage, your male heritage and your female heritage of both your parents involved in your life, except in the rare cases where something's going on that has to be um, stopped by law, and that can, ha that can be the mother as well as the father, obviously, but except in those rare cases, you, you want both your parents in there. That, that I, I know for me and my, for me and my ex-wife, I mean, we have such different parenting styles. We bring such different things to our kids. I mean, she's great for, it's, it sounds stereotypical, but she's great for hugging them, making them feel loved, and staying at home with them, taking care of them, and, and, and I'm the guy to 
take them out to Six Flags Magic Mountain, which we're doing next weekend, and and get out of the house and make things happen. And I, you know, make jokes and enjoy life. Not that she doesn't enjoy life, but I mean, we just we just play different roles with our kids, and they benefit from both of that. It's it's a it's a synergy that neither neither partner can provide by themselves. And, well, you mentioned uh, men being assumed as guilty, so let's talk about uh, false rape claims. Um, in the last, I guess, I don't know, maybe this century, uh, in the U.S. alone, something like between five and 700 men have been released from prison. Uh, DNA exonerated them from uh, claims made by uh, women. Uh, and that's probably the, the proverbial tip of the iceberg, uh, uh, in, in a sense. Oh, um, it has to be. It yeah. has to be, yeah. Well, um, why why do you think there has been an almost 180-degree flip from the assumption that uh, the woman uh, was uh, a whore and a, a guilty and, and brought a rape on herself to now the opposite? There was a famous case. I know some p kids on my website, uh, uh, this girl, Mattress Girl, who, who claimed some nonsense about uh, some boy raping her in her university, walked around with a bed mattress and whatnot. Now it's gone to the other extreme that that anyone who claims that they've been violated in any way, shape, or form, especially women, especially sexually, uh, you cannot not believe them. Just like you cannot not believe a child who claims they were abused, even though people forget the 1980s, for example, with the satanic cults, the supposedly Geraldo Rivera and all that kind of nonsense. Why do you uh, think we people don't look at just a case-by-case -case basis? Here's an accuser. Here's the defendant. Uh, let's let's look at the facts. Let's look at their, each of their credibilities. And in each single case, you have to look at it individually. Uh, why, why don't we just do what the law prescribes? Well, we're, we're very swayed by our, by our preconceptions. And in the old days, that resulted in, uh, and maybe even, to, well, not just the old days, even today, that results in, um, you know, people of color getting just getting convicted a lot more than um, white people. And the, and the same thing for um, males versus females. But the, the thing that's, that's so rightly amusing in a way is a lot of times you'll hear a statistic about, oh, you know, African Americans have such and such a thing 20% worse than, Caucasians do, and then you look into it for gender, and it turns out rather than twenty percent, it's three to one or four to one. I mean, oftentimes males versus females are, are quite a bit. The disparity is quite a bit more than racial disparities, but nobody talks about these, and because people feel like people love. It, it's a well-known phenomenon that people's intuitions are not always accurate. People let their intuition tell them, "Oh, you know, he probably deserved it somewhere. Maybe he didn't." I mean, people even explicitly said this. This has been actually explicitly said to people, like who were wrongly convicted to men who were wrongly convicted, like, "Well, you, you weren't guilty, but you, you, it gave you a lesson anyway that you needed to learn." I mean, <laughs> things like that have actually been said in in college rape cases and things like that, where the man was actually innocent. I mean, how outrageous is that? And I, I would venture to guess that if we could do these cases and have the gender concealed and, ha and th that there'd be a lot more fair results coming out. But of course, the, the principle of um, criminal defen defense says that you need to be able to view your accusers and, and they're, they're never going to do it that way. But uh, just for the sake of argument, if there was some way to take um, gender and race out of the equation, we might get a lot fairer results. Yeah. Well, let me uh, ask, too, about sexual harassment. I'll give you an example. Years ago, I worked at a magazine distributorship, and uh, we were we distributed all types of magazines and paperback books, including yeah. pornography. And yeah. the funny thing was uh, I had been briefly involved with one of the women that worked there, and so I was in a break room one time, and there were a handful of maybe a dozen magazines, three or four of them were porno magazines where I sat down. I just flipped the one. The woman who I had previously dated uh, was there, and and... She walked out of the room, and then about an hour later, I was called in, uh, claiming that I had harassed her because I was looking up pornographic magazines at a distributor that distributed pornographic magazines, and yet they were porno magazines just by her, but I wasn't harassed. So, uh, do you? How do you think? How do you think uh, uh, the parsing of what constitutes harassment in any sexual context? For, and let's forget about race and other aspects, but just say male-female dynamic. How has it gotten so skewed that, for example, uh, if I saw an attractive woman, let's say I was single, I'm married, but if I was single, I saw an attractive woman and went up to her, how could I go up to her without being viewed as some kind of a predator these days? You know, if I said, well, I think you're attractive or, or something like that, you know, it seems, it seems to the, the point where 
you can't say anything without someone being offended, especially in a sexual context. No, well, these are good questions. I had, I had two, they sort of hit on two separate areas for me. So the first, sexual harassment. Yeah, I mean, it's another area where um, definitions that originally were reasonable have just been expanded and expanded and expanded to the point of complete absurdity, really. I mean, look, does anybody condone, well, I shouldn't say anybody, do most people condone somebody going to work and, and somebody else, is, their boss is coming over to them and reaching into their clothes and they need to have sex with them or they're going to fire them? Do people condone that sort of thing? Of course not. So then, so then it's it, it's sort of here's what happened. I mean, it's a classic thing with the law. You start with a very clear case. That's a very clear case. Pretty much nobody wants what I just described. But then there's the gradual slide as things get expanded. People say, well, okay, so you don't want that kind of harassment, but you also don't want something that that verges on that but takes on a different form. So let's just say another case where the same boss says, oh shoot, I can't, you know reach into this employee's pants, I'm purposely not putting gender on the employee or the boss, but the sexual harassment happens in both directions. Males do sexually harass females, females do sexually harass males. The boss says, oh shoot, I can't sexually harass this employee of mine, so instead, I'm going, I know this person has told me their feelings about explicit body, so I'm going to, I'm going to offend them really powerfully, I'm going to put up all this porn, super pornographic imagery, I'm going to make lots of really explicit comments to them. I'm not going to touch them, but I'm going, to, I'm going to do all these other things. I'm going to make them feel super uncomfortable and create a really hostile workplace, which is actually the legal term, hostile workplace. And, and then the legal developments came that you can't do that either. And that happened before I went to law school in 1988 because I studied that in law school. I took employment discrimination as one of my classes at Harvard Law School. And um, so then they, took, then they got that, then they, they, but they kept expanding the definition further. So now it's gotten to the point where things like what you described are, can be considered sexual harassment is obviously ridiculous. I mean, you're in a workplace that has these magazines. You weren't even, like, sticking your tongue out and, like, leering at her as you were doing this. You were just looking through this book without even a reference to her, but she did somehow decided in her brain this is sexual harassment. I mean, things have just gone way too far that, that there's, a, there's a sweet spot somewhere, and, and there's a little flexibility. You don't have to have it exactly right, but there's some sweet spot in definitions and if they're too broad they sweep in people like Dan Schneider and if they're too narrow they don't they don't catch the boss that is coming up to their employee and like opening their fly and like touching their genitalia. I mean so there's gotta be a happy medium somewhere. <coughs> Obviously it's common sense but we seem to have lost common sense in this day and age. And let me go to my second my second thought now because we also need to think about dating, which is another thing that has been really uh issue for me uh, not issue but uh um, a theme in my life until recently. I, my um, ex-wife separated from me two and a half years ago, and so I wanted to find a partner, and I was dating until recently, and I, I am now happy that I have found my partner. I'm very happy about that. In fact, I met her at the Red Pill showing, ironically. the uh, She asked a question at the showing of the men's rights movie, The Red Pill, and that was how we met. So anyway, um, but what I found is that you do have a pretty narrow window of what's acceptable. I mean, and women, my experience of dating, this is my experience, this is what I experienced. I, I tend to be interested in the sort of type of woman you run into in Berkeley. They tend to be into, you know, various fringy activities. They sometimes have exotic dietary patterns and such things. And But a lot of these women, nevertheless, despite I'm sure they describe themselves as feminists, a lot of these women, they would never in a million years make the first move, or, or any move, to advance a relationship. They would, just wouldn't do it. They'd be caught dead doing it. So the whole burden, if you want to call it that, is on the male. But yet, with dating, the signals are usually ambiguous. I mean, and you have to make a choice and, and decide to try something or not. And you may get wrong some of the time. And, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I have a pretty good intuition. And so I usually guess right, but... Nobody's perfect, and people all need to loosen up a bit and chill out and realize that, like, this is life, and, like, you definitely can't legislate dating. And these people who are trying to have these consent rules for every step of the dating, give me a, give me a break. That's what I'm asking you. Give me a break. Are you serious? Men are going to go out with women, and in addition to all the things I've just described, 
you're going to create this like 150 step consent thing and they have to do everything perfectly. That's just, if anything's a libido killer, that's a libido killer. I mean, everybody's going to be celibate. That's just going to happen. <laughs> well, let me, so, let me just posit something for, for you. Uh, and, and I'll ask you philosophically if you agree with this. Um, uh, you'd mentioned harassment, and we've been, just been talking about it. About 30 years ago, during the savings and loan scandal, when I was a young man, I worked at a bank as a teller, and there was an older female boss uh, who, about 12, 15 years older, that liked me. I was dressing then in my Don Johnson, Miami Vice kind of uh, ties, you know, and whatnot. And she kept putting her hands on me. One day I said, just don't do that anymore. The very yeah. next week... Uh, she made up some crap about me that I had cursed at some customer or something, and I was I was let go from that job. Now back then, this is thirty years ago. I was like, okay, you know, maybe I should have reported her or something. But men don't do that, you know. Men don't cry. Men don't complain. Right. We just put up with shit. And my question is, do you think that the rise of uh, first civil rights, uh, feminism, uh, gay rights? Uh, disabled rights, all of this where a lot of people say now we're, we're empowered to complain and bitch but they don't want to hear it when a man complains because men should be strong men should not cry, men should not complain men should just take it on the chin but if a man says, well I don't want to take it on the chin there's something wrong for example in my case that I, you know like I said, I should have maybe reported this a woman when she was touching me here or there for a few weeks beforehand, but I didn't because it's... Right. So do you think that, that it's almost the sense that men's rights is... It, the, the PC left is sort of getting bit on its ass and it doesn't like it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everything you said is really true. I, I think that there's a lack of sympathy for a man. But, I mean, in the UK, they call it whinging, complaining. I mean... Yeah, and men and men don't like to complain either. I mean, it's just not. Again, it's it's people don't like to talk about evolution or differences between men and women, but it's it's not as much in our makeup. I mean, it's just not as much our tendency to, to do it. I mean, you know, I, I, speaking for myself, I mean, I'll I'll do it if I have to, but I mean, I just think the barrier to to males voicing any sort of complaint is a lot higher than than females and. Or, or, not just females, but let, let's just say uh, those of us who consider ourselves able-bodied and sort of uh, not a member of a racial minority and, and males, I mean, we're, we're not in any traditionally considered so-called minority group, although women are statistically the majority, but nevertheless, that's what they call it. Uh, we don't feel like we can get anything by, by lodging a complaint about anything. And, and I mean, I have to say, like, to a certain extent, we're right. I mean, to a certain extent, there isn't that much sympathy. I'm laughing, but it's it's a little bit sad too. Well, let me ask about the uh, the mainstream media. You mentioned the red pill and uh, uh, other. If you go on, you know, cable shows like the John Stewart show when he was on, or uh, who's the other bad uh, comedian that's always uh, uh, talking about something. But th there are all of these shows where they uh, they they rip on men's rights, and it, it seems to me. That, uh, like I said, we said there's a plan of it, and I think there certainly are some men's rights group. And if you look on trolling boards where people troll, there are some horrible things said. Yeah, on the other absolutely. hand, on the absolutely. other hand, it seems like the men's rights movement uh, is marginalized, sort of like Jenny McCarthy and the anti-vaccination movement. It be it's become like a joke to laugh about them. What do you think? What one accounts for that, and two, how do you distance yourself from that uh, marginalization? Well, how does it go what Gandhi said? First they laugh at you, then they argue with you, then then you win, or something like that. I don't have that exactly right, but I mean, I think I think we're, we're partly in the being laughed at phase, but what are they going to do? I mean, males are saying, hey, you know what? You're, we've got a 1,000, 10,000 women's health organizations in this country funded by the government and no male health organizations, and men have worth health, worth worse health than women. I mean, come on, give me a break, seriously. And, and a few of these things are just so outrageous that it's it's hard to believe that people can actually carry them on with a straight face. And now you're going to complain and like and like make fun of me when I bring this up. I mean, again, men's rights. I don't like the term. I'm not for men's rights. I'm for gender equity. And I, I, I you know, I, I know that that's terminology, but I don't like that terminology. I think it's 
phrasing things in a way that's misleading. Um, and so, and then it plays into the other side because what the other side loves to do is, is paint us. I mean, there's not even really an us because there's so many different strands to this movement, but paint NCFM and other groups as anti-woman, as troglodytes, as out of step with the modern sensibilities and laugh at us and ha ha ha, how stupid these people are. And, you know, that's a nice thing to do. I mean, it's fun to laugh at people. It's nice to feel superior to other people. It's not really that mature to do, but it's, it's a nice thing to do. I understand the temptation. Life is hard. It's nice to have a point to relax and feel like, oh, well, at least I don't have to worry about this interest group now. Another interest group I have to worry about. Oh, but I can laugh at them, so it's okay. I have to worry about them. But you know what? I, I'm sorry to say this, but I speak for myself. Mm. It's not okay with me that men die years earlier than women. And I'm willing to bet there's a lot of women married to men with male sons, with male beloved friends, male fathers. I'm willing to bet there's a lot of people that agree with me, that would like men to live as long as they can. We need these men's health organizations. I'm not just whistling Dixie here. The decisions that are being made by the government, the decisions that are being made by the women's rights organizations that lead to decisions by the government, because there's so many women's rights organizations in the government now, it is killing men. Make no mistake, men are dying who would be alive if these things weren't happening. This is serious stuff. And so you can laugh at men's rights groups all you want to. You can blackball us, but you know what? I don't like dying, and I don't think you like dying either, Gloria Stein. And I don't think anybody in the women's rights professorship likes dying, and I don't like it either. And you know what? I don't think anybody likes it. And so people, people need to get real here. This is serious stuff. Well, let me put uh, let me put a uh, question in the context of classism, which I think uh, is generally not addressed in, in these kinds of contexts. Um, there was the old movie "It's a Wonderful Life" that starts out with these points of light in heaven looking down at yeah. a life I to be in soul. Yeah. Now, I I've, I've often said to some people, if you were one of those points of light and you had a choice, uh, and and across centuries and across cultures and across economic strata, uh, as you said. Men live shorter lives. They live more brutal life, uh, br short, broody, and nasty, uh, nasty and brutish, as Thomas Hobbes once said. Uh, you're more likely to die of prostate cancer than you are of breast cancer. You're more likely, even though it's far more curable uh, if detected early. Uh, and all along the line, uh, boys are bullied more. They're, they're bullied more physically more. They're, uh, uh, you're going to die in wars more. You're going to die of murder more. You're going to be more exposed to sexual violence, drugs, depression, etc., etc. You know the whole litany. So I'm wondering, though, has anyone done any kind of studies, uh, and I'm asking you, uh, comparing that, a lot of this skewing about men having more relates to what has been termed in the last few years the 1%, meaning that when we're talking at the very top of society, especially across Western society, it's the Donald Trumps, the Bill Gateses, the, the Elon Musks, these, these rich, powerful men that, again, skew this because people look and say, well, it's all of these these white men that control all of, you know, the, the wealth and whatnot, so therefore men must be in charge, whereas working class guys like me, we are not, you know, we're not at that level and we don't have that power, but we're assumed to because of our skin color and our uh, sex. It, it, it's laughable. It's completely laughable. I mean, what about the fact that males are greatly overrepresented among the homeless? Why, why are people talking about that? Mm -hmm. Why, why are people saying, why are people assuming that all males are like the homeless? I mean, there's probably more homeless statistically than there are Elon Musk's, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. The, the whole thing's ridiculous. I mean, again, it goes back to... The, but you would the agree that it's skewed because of the Elon Musk's and the Trumps and the Gates. Yeah, of course I agree. Remember the yeah. bell curve? There's, yeah. there's more men, more males at both ends of the bell curve. There's more male Elon Musk's than there are female Elon Musk's, and there's a lot more dropouts, failures, whatever term you want to use. I don't know if there's any politically correct term to use, but people who haven't succeeded at life. At the other end, there's a lot more males, but nobody talks about that. It, it's, it's, I, don't know whether to think, I don't know whether to believe that people are deliberately being disingenuous or they honestly believe their own story after all these years. I think it's a little bit of both. But yeah, it is so tiring and misleading to hear this thing over and over and over. It's like an incantation about Elon Musk and Donald Trump and, and Bill Gates. and Who cares? They have nothing to do with our lives. I mean, 
And and at this point, males are falling increasingly behind in a lot of things relative to females, and it's having even less relevance to males' lives than it, than it used to. And um, the mind boggles. I mean, we've got so many problems to deal with, and so many so many things that need to be solved in society, and to be held back by this focusing. I mean. You know, I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but you almost have to ask yourself, well, why are they focusing attention so much on this clearly smokescreeny issue? What are they not wanting us to look at? I mean, why is it so important to keep mentioning these these same people, which, like you say, are such a small number numerically? And, you know, I, I wish we had a, a law, which has been proposed, and I think we had a variation of it in the distant past, that limited the disparity, the possible disparity in income, and if we had that, we wouldn't have these people making these crazy amounts of money, which doesn't, which in my view doesn't make them happier. I, I do not believe that people are happier once they're making enough money to have this luxurious home and live on and have plenty of money in the bank. Beyond that, I, I think it's, a, it's an achievement thing. It's, it's a male impulse gone wild and gone wild in a way that isn't constructive and that results in less equality and more disparity and I, I don't believe that Bill Gates is necessarily that happy a person. Maybe he is, but I definitely don't believe that CEOs as a group, these upper CEOs that everybody talks about, these mostly male CEOs, I definitely don't believe that their lives are of such high quality. I mean, the people I've known like that were just working all the time, and their marriages fell apart, and their and their, their, their kids hated them. And, and, and what kind of life is that? What kind of life is that? Well, so, let me let me just ask you, we're recording this in 2017. If we were to come back in 2030 or 2040, is there any three or four or five point plan of, that you think society as a whole could be improved? And what would those points be? For example, if you could uh, legislate uh, a law or, or change societal views, what are the three, four or five you know, points that might you know, achieve what you'd want in the next 13 or 23 years, say? I don't know if I remember that. I've never been asked that before, so it's hard to come up with a plan like that on the spot. I mean, well, imagine I, imagine you're Stalin and you have a five year plan or something, you know. Uh, well, we're, we're going to have equal spending on male health and female health. I mean, that's a biggie. Mm -hmm. that'll, that'll be a lot of good right there. And how uh, skewed is that right now? Is it 60 40, 70 30 in terms of genital health, say? Well, you know, uh, sexual well, spending health? Spending on female health, female health versus male health is 100 to zero as far as I know. I don't think there are any men's health organizations that are funded by the federal government. I mean, so that's, and that's, a, that's not just bad in terms of death and everything that I talked about earlier. It's also bad in terms of what it says to, to males. It says at a subconscious level, it says to males that you don't matter. And, you know, the learned helplessness phenomenon that we've seen in um, animals, these experiments they do where the where the frog starts stops swimming after half an hour if it, if it gets hopeless, but if it has a hope, it keeps swimming for up to 56 hours because it thinks that it can survive. The same thing happens with, with human beings, too. I mean, we, we subconsciously take lessons as to whether we're worth something or not. So that would, that would be a huge one. Um, I think we need to roll back um, laws about about issues between men and, men and women or they're perceived as between men and women. They're not always between men and women. Things like sexual harassment and rape and things like that. And anything that should be illegal should continue to be illegal. But, but the, the, the women's studies people see, need to stop trying to continually expand the envelope. And we're, we're, gonna be, we're getting, to the, getting to the point pretty soon where the word rape has no as it's currently interpreted, has little or no relationship to what people on the street think it means. And, I mean, I've spoken to people about this, and I know that most people disagree with this stretching of definitions. And so I think that has to happen. And, and Well, how about someone who falsely claims rape? Uh, if it's And let's say it, it's probably uh, going to be morally, uh, uh, more women, since more women will report rape than men. But uh, do you think that's a woman who has definitively been proved in, let's say like that mattress girl or, or something else that that uh, there's there was no rape there was no f physical violation there was maybe not even sexual intercourse uh, what do you think how is the law inadequate now do they get any punishment for perjury is it just perjury that they've committed or should there be added punition other than just simple perjury well I'm not I'm not I, I'm not a criminal lawyer I'm not and the law is different in each of the 50 states, of course. Um, 
So I, I'm not really, I'm not at all an expert on this question, but I I wouldn't think it would be inappropriate to have a law that would put the false accuser on some sort of parallel with the with the act they're accusing the person of because. If you falsely accuse somebody of rape, I mean, that could have an effect on the person's life that's more, more catastrophic or as catastrophic than being raped. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I haven't been raped. I'm not an expert on what the effects of being raped are. I know it can destroy people's lives. I know it can be the, by far the worst trauma that happens in their lives. But you know what? A false accusation can, too. I mean, a false accusation can mean you can't get a job. And as a man, if you can't get a job, that in itself is a huge problem. You're blackballed. Everybody with the Internet nowadays, everybody knows your history, nobody talks to you, you can't have any friends, your entire life is ruined. And, and, I, and, I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I've heard, I've heard just, that... Let me just, let me just finish. Yeah. A lot of these people have to put a gun to their heads and that's it. Yeah. So you basically kill the person by falsely accusing them of rape. And so I, I think there ought to be a consequence for that. And I've also heard that sometimes men who have been released from jail uh, or prison falsely or even been on trial falsely for rape had to have re registered as sex offenders but then it's almost impossible to get your name off there when you've been proven innocent. Is that so? I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, yeah. These are comp these are complex questions. Yeah. I mean, nobody loves women more than I do. Nobody wants um, a fair world more than I do, and that's the reason why I do this work. And I, uh, I people people sometimes disagree with me. You won't be shocked to hear. And that's just part for the course, and I, it's not even my job. I don't even get paid for this. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I work in a totally different area of the law for my for my paying job, and and um, and have you have you suffered anything from that from colleagues? Have you lost businesses because of your political or outspoken beliefs? I'm not looking for a medal, but it's you know I did meet my partner through it, so I'm grateful for that. Well, I, I, other people have suffered more. I mean, there, there's this organization that also works on the general cutting issue. Um, it's, it's now called General Autonomy America, though for many years it was called NOCIRC, N-O-C-I-R-C, and Marilyn Milos, who's the head of that, has suffered a lot more, more than, than I have. She's gotten death threats and all sorts of things. I mean, I had, well, I had one strange thing happen. I mean, somebody called my ex-wife's um, employer, but at that time she was my wife, we were married, and um, said to her, um, well, said to the company, why do you employ the wife of an anti-Semite? So let me unpack this for you a little bit. Uh, a few years ago, there was a controversy that had absolutely nothing to do with my organization. I was not involved in any way. There was a controversy where another group that I don't work that I don't work with in, in any way created a, a, a comic that is is anti-Semitic. Certainly appears to be anti-Semitic. Is anti-Semitic. Um, and so somebody found out about the comic. Somehow said, "Oh well, Arc also works on anti-genital cutting, um, and who runs Arc? Oh, Stevens Foboda." And then said, "Oh well, who is Stevens Foboda's spouse?" Which is not easy to find out. Um, my ex-wife is a very private person, and I had a column in Every Man magazine that ran about sixty issues about gender equity and the law, and I talked about my wife in there, but I, I had a pseudonym for her because she didn't want have her name publicized, so it's very hard to find out who my spouse is. Somebody somehow figured it out. Then, and my, my ex-wife has a fairly common name, too, so then, despite her common name, they somehow figured out where she works and called the place of employment up and said, why do you employ the, the, the wife of an anti-Semite? I mean, how crazy is that? I mean, so it's not so much that was a horrible harassment. I mean, my, my ex-wife never felt in danger of her job because of that. I mean, her boss was Jewish, and it it's not unimaginable that he could have fired her over that, but luckily he just sort of laughed at it. Um, so that, I mean, that's one thing that comes to mind. I mean, I, I, I've had some crazy stuff happen to me. I've had, you know, any movement attracts a fair share of people who are unstable, and I have to deal with these people, and they project stuff onto me, and, you know, make up false grievances. Uh, one, of, one colleague of mine is clearly uh, mentally um, unstable and has been accusing various people in the movement of <laughs> being mentally unstable themselves. And, I mean, all sorts of stuff happens, but but I mean, I feel like I've gotten off really lightly, honestly. Um, sort of flown beneath the radar, as it were. Um, but it's, it's not a lot of fun. You know, no, nobody likes getting uh, stuff thrown at them, whether it's fair, whether it's a... Uh, um, you know, I mean, in my case, it's relatively minor, but it's still not 
fun to have that happen. Well, let me just ask you then in the next year or two personally or with uh, your organization, uh, what do you, is there any particular case that you're looking at, maybe uh, something that's coming up to the Supreme Court or to a, a local uh, a state court or to you know a, a district court that you think is going to, to help the movement uh, as we wrap things up? Yeah. Well, we're, we're just, we're just about to release. Um, we're just about to do something we're very excited about. We, um, in fact, come to think of it, both of the two things we've done that I'm most proud of are about to have updates. Um, well, hopefully, in the next couple of years. Um, so, I went to Charleston, um, South Carolina, um, three years ago. I was invited to debate the American Academy of Pediatrics expert. Um, on circumcision, and they they, uh, they didn't they just pulled me off of our website. I worked really hard to keep our website fair minded and objective, and evidently we did a pretty good job because the American Academy of Pediatrics chose us to debate them, um, and we we won the debate. I mean, not officially. There's no document saying we won the debate, but the second day, the the AAP person looked at the audience and said, "I can't do anything to convince Mr. Svoboda that." our view is right, so I'm just not going to say anything. And I mean, obviously, the, he wasn't trying to convince me. The point was to convince the audience, and he basically threw in the towel. And the other thing that happened is, you've got to picture this, is I was sitting at this debate. There were four issues, eight debaters all together on the second day. I had a doctor on my right, a doctor on my left for two other issues, and both those doctors independently said to me, hey, Stephen, by the way, even though you're not a physician and everybody else on this panel is, I listened to your evidence that you presented and I'm changing my position. I'm now on your side. I now agree with you that circumcision is not medically necessary and is a bad thing. And so I just felt like the two doctors on either side of me changed their positions, and the doctor I was debating couldn't respond to our position. So we won that debate. So there's video of that that we took that we weren't able to release until the article got published from that debate. And the article's been published now. So we're about to release the video on that, so we're very excited about that. We have a top videographer, Eliyahu, under Sargon, working on that with us. We're happy you worked with us on that. That's going to happen in the coming weeks. And then the other project that um, I am proudest of from our history is I went to the United Nations way back in 2001. I led a team there, and we put the issue on the UN record for the first time as a human rights violation, you know, circumcision. And um, so there's some follow-ups happening to that in the human rights United Nations Human Rights Territory. I can't say too much right now because they're still being fleshed out and prepared. Um, but um, that work is continuing, and that was my vision when I went there in 2001. I, my idea was that at some point when the time was right, we would jump back in, and the time is right now. The UN is now saying that intersex genital cutting is um, torture, that so, so when you have a child that's not neither clearly male nor clearly female, and the parents and doctors tend to get very uncomfortable about that, which is another interesting gender issue. Why are we so determined to define things as male and female? Very interesting. Uh, they, they come in and do surgery that isn't medically necessary, and so the UN has said that's torture, and they, they've decried female genital cutting. So the time is getting, and of course the Council of Europe has denounced male circumcision, uh, numerous authorities in Europe have denounced male circumcision. Even the American Academy of, Pedi of Pediatrics doesn't support circumcision. So we think the time is right to move on this, and that's what we're planning on doing. Well, I will link to your website, National Coalition for Men, below this video. And my final question is, is there anything else about uh, men's rights or your organization that I've missed that you'd like to just add in here in the final minutes? Uh, I would just say that... Um, Keep an open mind as much as you can, um, and that's good for all of us in all phases of our life. Um, I mean, like I say, we're Attorneys for the Rights of the Child is in its 20th anniversary right now as I speak, and, and um, you might want to refer, refer people to both organizations. But, um, but anyway, um, when I first heard about the issue, I thought it was crazy. I thought it was weird. I thought, why would people even care about circumcision? And maybe, maybe there's some point there, but it's such a small point, like... Why should I waste my time on it? Um, but, you know, I think a lot of things, you look into them at first, and they don't seem to have merit, but you, you look into them more as I did, and eventually I started to feel like, well, you know, maybe there is some merit to this. And then as far as gender issues go, I mean, they're complicated, and 
some of your initial ways of phrasing questions, and I'm not trying to fault you at all because you're just phrasing things the way everyone phrases them, but there are initial ways that people think about things, but a lot of these issues, these gender issues, they aren't that simple. They're nuanced. Feminism isn't either good or bad. Men's rights, although I don't like that term, isn't either good or bad. I mean, this is the, the soup that we live in, and it would be nice if there were simple answers, but there aren't. And I think the important thing is to try to give everyone a fair shake. And wow, there aren't any male health clinics anywhere, there aren't any male health organizations anywhere funded by the federal government. Wow, well, there should be. Let's do something about that. I mean, keep an open mind and don't believe everything you hear, whether it's from the National Organization for Women or the National Coalition for Men. Investigate it yourself. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe we got fed some false information. Maybe now got fed some false information. Investigate. Think. Our brains are here for a reason, and they can do wonderful things, and our hearts can too. So use both of them. And that, that's what I ask of everyone. Well, thank you, Stephen Svoboda, and uh, thank you for a good conversation. Thank you.